Now you can argue that the government taking waste is actually a pretty good idea because, as I mentioned earlier, the waste is the material for atomic bombs. And I think all of us would probably agree that we don't want to be spreading these materials around the world willy-nilly. We want them controlled. So to have the government keep control of them sounds pretty good. But the government promised to start taking this waste in 1998. Yucca Mountain was going to be the answer. Now, Yucca Mountain is sometimes talked about as being a political thing. Uh, in fact, Harry Reid is, you know, you'll hear opponents saying, Harry Reid is just all politics. We need Yucca Mountain. But I maintain that the politics of Yucca Mountain occurred in 1987. That's when the scientific study of where uh, uh, finding a location, a good location for the uh, waste repository, the scientific process was stopped, and the political decision was to put it in Yucca Mountain. The Yucca Mountain is porous rock. It's in an area of volcanic activity. It's in an area of uh, earthquake activity, and it's over a major aquifer. I ask you, even if you're not a geologist, does that sound like a very good place to put something you need to keep safe and isolated for essentially millions of years? No. <clears throat> so uh, the utilities have sued for breach of contract to the government because the government did not fulfill what they promised. And already there have been two to three billion dollars paid out of the U.S. Treasury to the utility companies because we have not taken possession. Not out of the nuclear waste fund. And, and in fact, because there is no plan to have a uh, repository at the moment, they've stopped collecting any more money from the nuclear waste fund. But this, in summary, is the price problem of nuclear power that uh, it's this, what I call, nuclear socialism. That we bear the burdens so that a private organization has the potential to make great profit. If you're running a uh, nuclear reactor like Indian Point, you can make a oh, million and a half dollars a day, bro. It's pretty good money. But I don't think it's a very sustainable way to do this. Where's the free market when we need it, right? <laughs> now, Pollution, number two, pollution. There is pollution at every step of the nuclear fuel chain, starting with mining. The Navajo miners during uh, the Manhattan Project suffered tremendous uh, health impacts from the radon gas, the dust, and the mine tailings that to this day present grave dangers uh, that spread through water, air, and uh, in the soil. And, uh, it's really a, a terrible situation. The uranium refining, it was uh, White Mesa in Utah, was a town that was terribly impacted by the dust and radioactive pollution from the refinement of uranium. Then you have to enrich uranium. And uh, this, again, takes coal-fired power plants a huge amount of energy to uh, separate out the isotope U-235 is used for nuclear reactor fuel or for nuclear weapons. And in the uranium fuel, there is the U-235 isotope is 7 tenths of 1% of the uranium ore. This means if you have 100 pounds of uranium ore, you're going to end up with 99.3 pounds of depleted uranium, which is a toxic waste you're going to have 0.7 pounds of the U-235, which is what you're after. So this is a very dirty process to describe. <clears throat> Nuclear power as clean energy really, I think, defines reality. Uh, and in the use of the fuel produces hundreds of man-made isotopes, everything from cesium-137 uh, strontium-90, plutonium-239, through neptunium, uh, americium, and many, many other man-made radionuclides. And these are regularly released under normal operating conditions in the environment. 
Now, in 2006, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences issued the, uh, a report titled Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, Report Number 7. And in this report, it clearly states that there is that all exposure to radioactivity increases your risk of damage to health. Furthermore, it says that all exposure to radiation is cumulative over your lifetime. This means don't have any extra x-rays. CT scans in particular have huge amounts of radiation. If it's really absolutely mandatory to save your life, have a CT scan. They can be helpful. But if there's any way to avoid it, I recommend you to avoid it. You don't want, and same thing for uh, dental x-rays, uh, any kind of x-ray. Uh, if, if it's really going to change treatment, if it's going to give you some essential bit of information that there's absolutely no other way to get, use it. It's an important tool. But don't just have an x-ray just to see. Uh, my son is a hockey player. When he was young, he injured his knee. And two different doctors helped, and they were both exquisite doctors. But in both cases, after the office exam was finished, they each said, well, now we'll send you down to x-ray. And I had to ask, how will an x-ray change treatment? And the answer was, oh, it won't change treatment. We'll just know if his kneecap is cracked or not. We're not going to do anything different. And I said, well, thank you very much. We'll skip the x-ray. Yeah. So, um, when we talk about health consequences, then, well, well let, let me just add two more things. I talked about the regular releases. Also, there's the leakage from nuclear power plants. This has been a problem here at Palisades. It's a problem at Indian Point. It was a big problem in Vermont Yankee. In fact, at Vermont Yankee, I think one can argue a major factor in the change of opinion in that state of Vermont was the fact that the Energy, the same company that runs the Palisades, lied about what was happening. And people don't like to be lied to. And once your credibility is gone, it's very hard to reestablish trust. And then, of course, we have accidents like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima, which I'm, Fukushima is so tragic, it continues to this day to leak vast amounts of radioactivity in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we know not what that means to us. We know that in a very short time after Fukushima happened, there was radioactivity, at, at 10 days after the explosion, there was radioactivity found in the Yelp in Boston from Fukushima. Now, the US EPA said, uh, don't worry, though. It's so little, it's not a concern. Oh, yeah, right. You've heard this no discernible effect yeah, right. kind of thing, the minimization. My response to that statement is, wait a minute. You're telling me it's in the milk supply. Now, you're telling me it's not very much. So maybe not very many people will get it, but it's in the milk supply. Somebody's going to get it. And if it's in your glass of milk, your cup of yogurt, your scoop of ice cream, your piece of cheese, it's a very big deal. So again, it's, this is a kind of minimization that I think is very misleading. But to determine the health consequences is very complicated. It's, it's a difficult science. We can't do double-blind controlled studies because morally it's not acceptable to expose people to radiation just to see what happens. I mean, in fact, there are some very sorry parts of our history where this in fact, was done in this country. But science won't do that. It's hard to control for other factors. You might be exposed to radioactivity from palisades, but there's also pollution from diesel uh, trucks. There's also pesticides. There are many, many other things in the environment. And if you get a cancer, there's no label that says this cancer was made in palisades. No. <laughs> so we don't know. I mean, it's, it's, PSR is very concerned about being scientifically legitimate. And so when we can't say, we're going to say it. We can't say it. So the absolute science is difficult. But as I mentioned, the National Academy of Sciences says there's no safe exposure. And I do need to say that it's much more than cancer that uh, 
is impacted from radioactivity. There can be problems with lungs, eyes, heart, circulatory system, many effects, as well as genetic complications in future generations. So let me talk lastly about proliferation. Um, I have already mentioned that the purpose of nuclear reactors was first and foremost to make the materials from nuclear bombs, and that this has been the problem with the rain. Um, I would suggest that Mr. Obama, it, it's not socially acceptable for him to go to Congress and say, I need a lot of money to build new nuclear bombs. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't fly. But he can go and say, I need a lot of money for to develop new nuclear reactors to solve climate change. Now, in fact, nuclear reactors cannot solve climate change. There's a book called Insurmountable Risks by Bryce Smith. You can download uh, the summary and parts of that book online. Uh, he goes into great detail explaining how, even if we said, OK, all of us who are against nuclear power are just going to stand back, just go with it. And we can't do it. We don't, it. We'd have to be opening up so many more uranium mines, building uh, reactors, you know, opening them up every couple of weeks, new Yucca Mountains. We can't even get one Yucca Mountain. You know? So the, it's not an answer to climate change. But by pursuing nuclear power, you are fostering the very same infrastructure. This is in academia. This is industrially. Uh, it's the same infrastructure that supports nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons are still the centerpiece of US defense, even though this country spends more on defense than the rest of the world combined. We rely on nuclear weapons as the ultimate weapon. And I think the fact that we do sends the message to other countries that they need to as well. So uh, it's a very bad idea. And I mentioned earlier that there was little thought given to the environment. Areas like the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in uh, Washington State, uh, the Savannah River site in South Carolina, the Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho, these are horrifically polluted areas. Billions of dollars are being spent every year to try to clean them up, and we're barely making a dent in them. Those three areas I mentioned are associated with three important water systems, the Columbia River, the Savannah River, and the Snake River Aquifer, which are all greatly endangered by this activity. And here, it was mentioned earlier that just outside the door here is Lake Michigan, which is part of the greatest freshwater resource in the world. And to risk that to nuclear activity is, I think, uh, so, so terribly unwise. So every day that these nuclear reactors operate, they're producing more waste. We don't know what to do with it. Uh, because there is no repository, and no other country has solved this problem either. You know, sometimes people say, well, why can't we be like France? France gets 80% of their electricity from nuclear. Well, France also has one government-owned company that uh, builds reactors, another government-owned company that runs them, and it operates with very little transparency. I don't think we're quite ready in this country to take that path. And they haven't solved the waste problem. They reprocess their irradiated fuel. Reprocessing on paper sounds like a great idea. You get more energy out, you reduce the volume of the waste. What's not to like? Well, what's not to like is the cost and the pollution and the fact that it actually creates more waste streams. And it does not get rid of the need for a repository. It may concentrate the waste more, may make it less volume, but it's hotter waste. And part of figuring out how to put waste in the ground, you have to take into account how hot it is. So you really don't gain much except more nuclear waste. So I think we need to be thinking about keeping the waste on site, if it's safe, 
And Palisades is probably one of the handful of sites in this country where there's legitimate reason to move the waste off site. But that it needs to be in hardened on-site storage for the foreseeable future while we figure out what to do with this. Now, there are jobs that exist to operate a nuclear reactor. What happens when we shut it down? Is this community going to lose those jobs? Is it going to be out of luck? I think not. I think there will be many jobs needed, desperately needed, to clean up that contaminated site, to figure out what to do with the waste, and to keep that safe essentially forever. The Chernobyl site uh, today has over 3,000 workers on site every day. Even though the site's closed down, they're attempting to build the biggest building ever built in the world to cover that sarcophagus to prevent another meltdown and release of radioactivity. There could be uh, another earthquake, another tsunami at uh, Fukushima, which could, again, have a second shoot of rock in that just tragic <coughs> circumstance. So we're not out of the woods. But I think we need to keep, we need to stop making this stuff. And we need to push for the alternatives. And there are alternatives. I'm so glad to see the action in this community and the efforts to, to see that a German company next door has solar panels is really quite amazing in this community. And it, I think it points out that Germany is getting ahead of us. Germany is an industrialized country. It's more northerly than we are. It doesn't have much sunlight. And yet, they're getting an increasing amount of their energy from solar. Plus, the cost of solar is decreasing greatly in Germany. It's much cheaper now than it used to be. It's very competitive. The same is true with wind energy. But how's nuclear doing? Nuclear is a very mature industry. It's not like this is the first couple of plants they're trying to build. No. There have been many reactors in operation, and yet the cost continues to skyrocket through the roof. So I think that those are a great number of the reasons why Physicians for Social Responsibility advocates for the shutdown of nuclear reactors and for the development of truly safe truly clean and renewable energy sources. So I'd also like to mention that there is a book entitled Carbon Free, Nuclear Free, a Roadmap for U.S. Energy Policy. You can download this book in its entirety for free at the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, www.ieer.org. You can also buy a hard copy if you prefer that format. But this book was written in 2007. It assumes the American level of energy consumption. Now, you may know that in Europe, on a per capita basis, they use half as much electricity. But hey, you and I all know that life in Paris is only half as good as it is here. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we don't really want to go there. The, the author. The author One like wasn't one putting that as a condition for this solution, saying we can go ahead and be energy gluttons. We can you know, use all the energy that we are currently. The author also assumed existing technology. If there's no silver bullet that still needs to be developed in order to make this work. This roadmap, published in 2007, shows how we can phase out of nuclear, phase out of coal burning, and still have the lifestyle that we're accustomed to. In the intervening years, in the seven years since the publication of this book, the author says the advances have only made this more possible and in a quicker time frame. So this is not pie in the sky wishful thinking. There is a clearly spelled out path that we can take. I'm sure that there are other paths that would also work with this. And perhaps some of these activities in this community will help uh, achieve this. But there are alternatives, and there is a healthier, cheaper, and better way of the electricity we need in our lives. So that ends my presentation.
And I'd very much like to have a discussion and entertain any questions or comments that members of the audience may have. Yes.